we said, Susan Bond, you gotta have her speak. She's totally awesome. Uh, and I said, I went and looked at her stuff and uh, traded some emails. And I said, yes, you are right. Uh, she's totally awesome. She should speak. And this is one of the many helicopters that we're flying for today. When I was 12, the women in the crowd will be able to understand this and the men most probably won't, but I was watching the Miss Universe pageant with my mom and my sister, maybe you guys watched it too, I don't know, but probably little girls, right, you watched the Miss Universe pageant, and my mom said to us, you know, if you could be which one, which one would you be, as if we could change our race or something. My sister's like, I want to be Miss Thailand. And I said, I want to be the translator. Right? It's a guy. It's the 70s. Right? <laughs> it's a dude. And my mom looks at me, and she just goes, okay, which one do you want? <laughs> and that was my first clue that I was living an unconventional life, and that I was going to have to figure out a life that worked for me. Right? That reaction from her was, wow, fate, we are not in Kansas anymore. This girl doesn't look at the world like, you know, the rest of us. I grew up in Detroit. My dad's an engineer. I'm, my family is full of engineers, teachers, and um, lawyers. Translator, other world, because she asked me why. And I said, well, because I want to talk to the whole world, and I want everyone to communicate and get along. And she thought that was really nice, but, you know, kind of strange. So that became a whole lifelong odyssey for me to talk about um, and to think about how do we create a lie that really works for us, right? How do we, instead of, a, what I call it self-sourcing, how do you create a life that works for you versus crowdsourcing your life, doing what you think you should do or, you know, looking at Zuckerberg and thinking about, you know, next Groupon or the next Facebook or the next whatever. And so it's something that I started to think a lot about and I've spent most of my life thinking about, uh, about how do we, I need to stand. <laughs> I'm a pacer. Um, how do we create a life that really works for us and how do we um, make sense of that life and then create it, right? Because I think it's easy for us to fall into things where we just go along with what the crowd does. Does anybody have experience this, right? Everybody kind of gets what I'm talking about, right? Did any, anybody have an experience in their life, right, where you thought, wow, I really should go this safe path, but that's not really the path I want, right? Some not nods, right? So that led me in an odyssey of my own life um, I've, I've spent many years, uh, I have a bunch of different degrees in like human stuff, and I've spent, <laughs> human stuff, right? I would swear, except that this is on camera, and my mom might watch it one day, which one of them proud. Um, I have a whole bunch of degrees in human stuff, and I spent 11 years doing executive coaching, working with CEOs and tech companies, um, um, and all those kinds of things. That's kind of where my experience comes from. So let's go back to when I was. Uh, so I, I, I'm looking at the world. And I want to be a translator. And then I go to my high, my high school guidance counselor. They wanted me to be in something ridiculous, right? You're laughing, right? You had the most ridiculous thing they said: do something really silly or ridiculous or really something stable. I think I got like police officer. I was like, are you kidding me? Have you met me? I hate rules. Like, no. Um, so I started to go through life, and in college I wanted to be a music, I wanted to be a singer. My mom said, be a music teacher. I was like, that sucks. And then I went, oh, I want to be a writer. No, I'll be an English teacher. So I kept getting these messages, right? I mean, other people I think understand this, right? Go back to, like, something safe or normal or, you know. And I kept getting these messages, and finally enough of them came along, so I decided to go into the corporate world and just become a corporate person, rather than um, listening to who I really was. And I kept trying to fit in, you know, like, I bought the right clothes, right? I spent a lot of money on clothes, I mean, thousands of dollars on clothes. And I cut my hair a certain way, and I took certain jobs. And I spent a lot of time doing that, and I, one day, um, I was really unhappy with myself. And my sister, who I'd been complaining about, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I'm unhappy. I think I should do this, but I don't know. All this drama. 
And she looked at me and she said, you know there's no rule book, right? There's no one rule book with one answer. And I thought, no, you're joking with me. There is a rule book. Just give it to me. That's what I said to her. Give me the rule book because I want to follow it. Um, so things kind of started to fall apart for me because I was there was no rule book and I wanted to, you know, go along with the crowd. Um, I got laid off four times in 11 years in corporate America. Every single time, my job disappeared. I mean, my job was eliminated. Susan Bond's job. Sometimes there was a couple other people. Most of the time, it was my job that got eliminated. Um, I was in San Francisco, and looking for the gap, and I got really, really sick. And this is one of the biggest awakenings for me. So I'd been sick for six weeks. Um, for three weeks, I had a fever of 102 degrees straight. Uh-huh. It's like drying, slowly. And uh, I worked for uh, I worked for the Gap, and I was managing one of their stores. And I was so insistent on doing a good job and proving that I could do it that I didn't take a day off ever during that whole time. Um, and then I ended up um, on a Sunday morning with pains radiating down my shoulders, like out. You know, like they talk about heart attacks. And I was 27 years old. And um, so, but I, my boss was coming in. Uh, Essentially, Mickey, Mickey Drexler, who is the president, his wife was coming in. So, to TJ's story, right? Another wife of the big guy is coming in to my store. <laughs> so I go and I buy a suit. What do I do, right? I'm going to go try to fit in. I buy a suit. Um, that night, I had a 105 degree fever after taking the night off. And um, I finally, my roommate drags me to the hospital. Long story short, they discover I had a pint of fluid. Pericardium is like the sac that surrounds your heart. Um, that night, they called my parents and said, essentially, you need to come here now because um, your daughter's going to die. They didn't think I'd make it through the night. Uh, the ne they got there that night. I was so sick that they let my parents come until 11 o'clock at night in cardiac ICU. I'm 27. And uh, the next morning, all of a sudden, I throw up. And I, everything starts going haywire, and people are freaking out. And I'm vaguely aware of this, and I'm essentially flatlined. So uh, everything is going out, um, and I'm, I'm it's really peaceful. It's like, huh? Well, that little shit about trying to fit in, trying to do it right, the right <laughs> clothes, it doesn't really matter right now. Like, if they don't get here in five minutes, I'm dead. <laughs> I'm, I'm gone. It's really the most peaceful place in, in, in I've ever had in my entire life. Um, and so they got there in time, obviously, I'm here. Uh, and I woke, I said, okay, give me the will to fight, or like, just take me now, it's fine. I woke up and um, I slapped the doctor. I, and I lived. Uh, he was putting a, to my defense, he was putting a ventilator down my throat. It really, really hurt. Um, so I slapped him. I slapped another doctor because he blew a vein. If anyone knows what that is, it's really painful. So they go up. Yeah. Uh -huh. like, anyone's eye melt together, it's super painful. You don't want to you know, so obviously I survived that, but I looked back, and the reason I survived it was because I was in the in, I was in the emergency room, and I was dying, and I didn't know. I mean, you kind of know when you're dying. At least I knew when I was dying. Um, and the doctor said, "I can't figure out what's wrong with you other than a really bad fever." And I said, "I don't know what's wrong with you. But you have to admit me now. You have to admit me into the hospital right now." And the, that is the only thing that saved my life because two days later I would have collapsed. And that was sort of this awakening for me of, you know, uh, around my intuition and that I really needed to just listen to myself. And I, I just really needed to stop listening to anybody else. And that was when I was 27. The 30s were a rough decade. A little, a little rough. Back and forth, you know. You know when you're trying to learn something new, right? That whole failure piece that he talked about, right? I had a lot of failures. And I'm also, you know, be brilliant and excellent. That's, that's a history for me. It's a, a nice story. So I went back and forth, you know, got laid off a bunch of times, had my own business, then, you know, started in the middle of the downturn, you know, gave up on the 401k for it. So it was a lot of back and forth and back and forth. Um, and what I started to do was help other people. So I wrote a book about intuition and I worked with folks. And I saw how people couldn't, 
it's a really hard thing to live a life of nobody wants to, especially if it's a little bit lonely or a little bit different. And um, I guess what I learned was there's a couple different things to it. And uh, I actually want to leave a lot of time for you guys to kind of just talk about some of these concepts and ask me any questions or share your own stories. Because I think we've all, right, hasn't, I mean, who hasn't had a time where they didn't know what they wanted to, or they, they didn't know how to get where they wanted to go, right? Is that, you know, right, we've all kind of struggled. Like, how do I be me? How do I be uniquely me? And how do I make my impact? And whether it's personal or whether it's business. We've all had that. So there's a couple of things. You know, it's one, you really got to understand who am I? What is my unique, truly unique value proposition and impact in this world? And I'm sorry I use that word value proposition, but it's still <laughs> Damn it. Uh, what's my unique thing in this world? I can use it that way. Um, like for me, mine's being a translator. I'm really great at translating things, taking ethereal subjects and translating them down and making them real. Um, you know, translating between organizations and between people. That's where I've spent my entire career. Uh, then it also goes down to, you know, what do I dread? And just stop doing that. Like, just, if you don't like it, stop doing it now. I mean, now. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do, it's like we have this belief that we have to do something hard, and it's hard work and effort. But it isn't. You, you stop doing what you don't like to do. If you dread it, stop doing it, right? Have you had yeah. something you stopped doing? Um, I can't think of an example, but I, I know the feeling. You get it, right? You're yeah. like, sucks. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't, don't do it. Um, and the last piece is really figuring out a way that a life that works for you. You guys not even had that moment of like, I dread it, I hate it, don't do it. Right? It's hard. It's hard because we think there's all these shoulds, you know. We should ourselves to death. We just should ourselves to death. So last thing is stop doing that and really figure out what works for you and create that life that works for you or that business or whatever it looks like. I spent a lot of my career working, I'm going to tell you a couple stories about the people I work with. Um, I spent 11 years as an executive coach, and I worked with a bunch of folks. I worked with a guy who was a PhD in um, candidate in philosophy, and he didn't like it anymore. And he wanted to go into business. Right? He was like, wow, how do you do that? You know, um, I, I worked with folks who want to be fashion designers, and I, I helped figure out some people, you know, move out here and be a fashion designer works with all sorts of folks who created a life that works for them. We all think it has to look like this, and it's like this little linear path. You know, I don't think that way. I think in circles, in spirals, and stars, and I don't think linear, you know? I, that, and I, I think we don't have to live a linear life. Um, so to the, for me, I'm now 42, uh, and I finally figured out, like right around like 39, it all went to crap. I got laid off twice in one year. Um, I had to, I had financial nuclear meltdown. This was uh, 2008, 2009. Uh, everything fell to crap. Found out I couldn't have children, which was bad, but in a way, it, you know, because it changes who you are as a woman. Who am I as a woman? I cannot have children. And men, maybe men can understand that, but I think women can understand. Even if you don't want them, if it gets taken away, you're like, wait, wait, well then who am I? Um, I walked out, and this is a true story, it's embarrassing, but I think it, you know, I walked around that night when I found out, um, a little tipsy, saying, I'm a he, she, I'm a he, she. Yeah. That bad, thinking about, like, who am I as a person? What, what is my life to be about? So it all melted down, I went to crap, and I took my dog and threw her in a car and we moved to Boulder. So I moved to Boulder a couple years ago. Um, I had my own successful business, and now I work for someone else. I will for a little while, translating, helping take their vision and translate it and make it marketable, and I'm going to move on again. And I said, screw it, I don't care what anyone else thinks if I need to work at a job for 10 years and get some stupid golden watch. My dad worked at GM for 35 years, really, like, you know. He has, like, pat he has patents, and he's got their, like, encased little silver dollars for his patents. That's what he got. For two inventions, and one of those inventions, 10 other inventions. He worked, don't ask me what they are. It's like, can you take me out of folds for cars? I don't know anything about that. Um, so I guess I just leave you with, you know, how do you self-source your life? Where are you at in that whole process, right? You know, there's the hero's journey where you start out, and you're going to go slay the dragon, and then you're like, oh, crap, this is really hard. I'm just going to go back and not slay the dragon, but I need to slay the dragon. 
oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, okay, I'm slaying the dragon, right? And now I'm moving forward. You can think about that in terms of a self sort of slaying. I'm curious about where people are at, and, and, and hopefully you resonated with my story. Um, and think about where you, how you can create even more self sourcing. something to do it and don't think about trying to do it just right just well it's hard too for people who brought up to be brilliant right that whole failure piece that really yeah. resonates with what you said right there's like a piece of a self-source life thank you tj that's so great is about failure and screwing up and not knowing and you know you leave the shore and you have to consent to leave the shore and not know where the heck you're going to go and not know if you're going to find the shore again but you will Uh, not to go any, into anything too specific, but um, as far as the concept of security and that whole decision, um, there is definitely a point of realization where um, being securely miserable <laughs> doesn't really re, you know, leave, give much dividends at the end of the day. I mean, if you can be, com you know, it's a, a cage is the safest place you can be. Nothing's going to happen to you in a cage. You know, somebody, you know, you have your totally safe, also totally cut off. So, yeah, I definitely resonate with the concept of, of, I mean, there really isn't a safe route. I mean, plus, I mean, if you look at the world of entrepreneurship, I mean, all the big things that have happened have happened when people have broken out and really gone after something. And if you, the only way to really be successful is to find where your your key value is and really apply that. Um, that's where the, the real path to success lies on, you know, finding and exploiting your own value to the level that's the that, highest that potential. So perfectly said. I'm so glad because I forgot a couple of my points, but I didn't want to bring up a piece of paper. I love it. That's so perfectly said. Uh, I don't know your name. Nice Amen. man with a really cool mustache. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mustache? It's really awesome. I don't know what you call it, but it's really cool. I know there's like whole nomenclature for uh, mustaches. Um, it's really true, you know, I kept trying to go to the corporate world because I kept thinking this is security and this is stability and this is the way I'm supposed to go. And I got laid off four times in 11 years, twice in one year, February 27th and March 4th, right? I mean, it says something to you, right? And so I decided that for me, stability was through instability because I'm a translator and you don't need translators for a lot, you know, for long stretches of time necessarily, right? So I go into an organization, I'm there two, three years to help you translate into your new culture. Or, you know, uh, right now I'm in marketing and sales and I'm helping to create this whole thing. But I found stability through instability. And I found it through a way that works and it took a tremendous amount of effort. My dad worked at GM for 35 years. My mom was a housewife and a teacher before that. I mean, literally I'm the weird black sheep of my family. But I love what you're saying, it is. It's like, that, that is a cage that you get stuck in. Right? I got stuck in that cage with a lot of really nice expensive suits that made me feel like I wanted to age. Right? And left me with no money, less than no money. So I love your point. Thank you. It's such a good point. Can you some, yeah. One of the things you talked about was basically not doing, not following the path that's laid out for you, but following your own path. And one thing that resonated with me was taking charge of your medical treatment. That sounded like people didn't want to admit you because they were wrong with you and people just wanted to sort of do stuff. Can you talk? A little bit more about how you took some charge of getting help from people who didn't really know what was wrong with you. Yeah, it's good. I'm glad you brought that up because you guys are reminding me of concepts. That I, I have concepts. I got so excited about the stories. Um, I don't know if 
if I said this in the beginning, but like this whole concept of living an outside in versus an inside out life is really important. We live our lives outside in, and that means I look at like, okay, here's my guidance counselor, what they're saying, here's what I'm supposed to do. Here's what the doctor says, and here's what I'm supposed to do. Rather than saying, here's me, Susan, and applying it to the outside world, how does that work? Um, I'd always been intuitive as a kid, um, and I'd been sick. I spent the first two years of my life off and on in incubators for um, asthma. It was an oxygen tent and, and uh, all of that. Um, and so over the years, I actually, my father, even though he's an engineer, you think he wouldn't be, he was like, listen to your body. What is it telling you? What is your body telling you? And so he helped me really listen. And when you're on death's door, it really becomes a matter of saying, you know, you fight so hard to become like an animal. Literally, I slapped people. I didn't care. My ass was hanging out. I didn't care, you know. Um, so it really it becomes a matter of how I did it was I just knew in my heart this was what I needed to do. It was like a defining, absolutely defining moment that I actually wish I had every day. You know, I wish I remembered it every day. I'm so blessed. And so that's a horrible experience. I'm like, no, it's the best experience I've ever had. Because now I know I'm never going to go back. And when I do go back, I just, remi you know, I remind myself. Um, so <clears throat> it was just my clear insistence with people and my clear knowing that there was something seriously wrong with me. I've now discovered that a true fever for me is 99. 105, I don't know how I even have brain cells left, right? I mean, I, I was literally burning up on the inside. Did I answer that enough, like how I did it? You know, it was just really a clear, uh, at that point I had started to think about who I was and I, it always was there. The thing is, is like that inner compass is always inside of us and it just came out. I'm pretty sure that I'm the oldest dog in the backyard here. So <laughs> I'll tell you, the path that you've gone down is a great idea because I've seen it, from, from my opinion, so differently because of the fact that I went down the path with the house and living in a neighborhood with a bunch of people that you get to know and you stay with for a long time. And now all of my friends are freaking out because my wife and I threw all that aside and we changed up the way we live and we got rid of everything that we could get rid of so that we can go out and have more fun and enjoy life more. So I'll tell you, again, I'm the oldest dog here, so I, I think you, you really have to look at that while you're the ages that you are and, and break a little bit loose and enjoy yourselves more. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You know, it really is so important. It can sound like a foo-foo topic, but I really ask you guys to look in your hearts and figure out how you can create that life even more because I think we get stuck into that and, you know, I, that's incredible, by the way. Congratulations on that. Oh, yeah, one more. Hey. Um, throughout my life, I've made some pretty disruptive changes. At times, like I was raised in a really religious conservative family and was pushed into getting married. And I did at 21. And then a couple of years later, my wife and I moved uh, a thousand miles away to get away from the family and just kind of made a huge life change. And then I found myself uh, two or three years later, 25. I felt like I was going on 45. I had a mortgage, a house, an hour each way commute, and I was completely miserable. Started working at a startup with other people who were my age and doing things that I probably should have been doing at that age. So I said, screw this, I'm moving on. So I disrupted it. And then worked, you know, again, and felt like I was stuck and, you know, just this, this last year, you know, basically through a very comfortable life at the beach, running a successful company, making good money, out the window, start over. And there's one fear that, that plagues me, and I wonder if other people have that same fear, and hopefully we can talk about it later, which is you sit down, you think about it, you go, am I always going to be this way? Like, am I always going to get comfortable and then throw it out? and start over? Is that any way to live? And then I worry, you know, am I asking myself that because that's what society wants for me is to be stable? Or am I asking that because I truly have a concern that I'm just never going to be happy? That is such a good, I love, we're going to leave you right on that because I think that is such an amazing question and a good place to find it. Thanks everybody. <laughs>